be. She, she died. Twenty twenty two has more or less been my midlife crisis as a gamer year. A year where I've largely become apathetic to new releases and have been going back to replay some of my favorite games from growing up, classics I missed when they were new, and games I just remember enjoying but haven't revisited in far too long. In spirit of the spooky holiday, I thought this would be a great time to discuss free radical designs. Second Sight. A game I remember being really cool, having an amazing plot twist, some spooky atmospheric moments, and really neat gameplay. It was always a bit of a shock to me that this game didn't manage to hang on to any relevance, hardly even getting whispered about in conversations today. But I guess Second Sight just didn't really have any staying power. In fairness, it was a linear, one-and-done action-adventure game that didn't take too long to beat, it didn't have any gripping emotional drama, and it kind of lacked in the memorable characters department as well. There just wasn't much reason to replay the game, nor were there any multiplayer modes to keep it in people's collections after completing it. So Second Sight got traded in a lot. In fact, I'm pretty sure even I traded in my original copy, and my original copy was either bought from a bargain bin or as a trade-in. No, of course I later bought the game again, probably for the same price I got it for the first time, from a bargain bin or a trade-in. And now that I'm replaying it again, what is this, for the first time in 15 to 20 years? I, let, okay, let, me, let me explain, I was down. just- shut up! Okay, okay, Put just, your hands on just the let floor. me explain. I, shut up and get down but, to the ground! I, uh, get, what are you doing? Uh, what? Stop that. Hands on the floor. Ah! Boy, is it not anywhere near as fun or cool as I remember. Novel in concept for sure, and very ambitious and creative, but also deeply flawed to the point where it can be hard to take seriously sometimes. Which really works at odds here, as the game's story takes itself incredibly seriously. But that's not to say that it doesn't still have some cool things going on. This was a story first game when it went into development, and some of the story beats still hold up today, and might even validate an entire playthrough for. But the gameplay design could have used a lot more work. But then you don't make an omelette without cracking a few eggs, and Free Radical Design was always about making omelettes, unlike anything you ever tried before. So let's take a quick look at Free Radical Designs as a company. But first, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tark's Gauntlet. I'm Tark's, these are my gauntlets, and I am really f***ing tired. Yeah. If you're new around here and you like what you see, make sure you hit that subscribe button, click the like button, and all the other buttons that you can hit, hit those buttons, and uh, maybe leave a comment down below. Below. Let me know what you think, feel, whatever. This isn't the normal type of video I usually do around here, okay? It's Halloween season, you know, spooktober. Thought I'd get one game out that kind of has a little bit of a spooky atmosphere to it. But normally this channel is for like, you know, RPGs and just stuff that I'm quite particularly passionate about. Oh, and pay no mind to the mess behind me. We, we actually had a, a hurricane here recently. A little bit of water got into the basement. Uh, everything's fine. It's being cleaned up. Or it's not fine. And I require your support with a one-time donation on coffee to make sure I can recover from this. But not really. But if I could get your support, that's great. That aside, it is time to put Free Radical Design and Second Sight through the gauntlet. That's really, really f***ing cheesy. I'm probably never gonna say that again. It is not a catchphrase. Forget you ever- Free Radical Designs, for all intents and purposes, first took shape in the mid-90s at Rare Studios, where a then greenhorn game developer named Martin Hollis was given a team and the monumental task of developing a first-person shooter for Nintendo's new 3D home console, the Nintendo 64. Such a task came with many hurdles, not the least of which being the console itself and its single analog stick controller. Something revolutionary for the time, but still limiting in its own ways. The vast majority of Martin's team being juniors new to the world of game design also didn't help. On top of this, there was incredible pressure for the game to be good and perform well, as it would be using the highly respected and very well-known 007 IP. Using Virtual Cop as a template for design, Martin worked an average of 80 hours a week every week for two and a half years to get the game developed alongside the game's primary designer, Duncan Botwood. 
Perhaps due to the intense pressure the team had on their shoulders, they were able to take the rock and hard place they were stuck between and crush it into a diamond of a game. That game, of course, being 007 Goldeneye, a title that still today remains one of the highest ever rated games and is fondly enough remembered that news of a remake 25 years later was met with great enthusiasm. Immediately after Goldeneye's completion and release on the Nintendo 64, while the team was still being showered with accolades, they were offered the opportunity to produce another 007 game based on the latest movie at the time. It was an offer they promptly declined, as they were all well and sick of the world's most famous secret agent by that point. However, their exploration into the first person genre didn't end there. They would move on next to work on a new game called Perfect Dark, which was in some ways a spiritual successor to Goldeneye, one that allowed them much more freedom during development. Perfect Dark reviewed quite well, and many people still regard it as the better of the two first-person shooters. However, critical response and sales were not quite as good as GoldenEye's, as the game simply didn't feel as fresh as GoldenEye had when it released. It's not your fault, sir. I should have been quicker. Around the completion of Perfect Dark, some of the team members were beginning to feel a little disillusioned with Rare Nintendo, causing some to seek new ways to expand within the genre they spearheaded a revolution in. So over the next year, many of the team members would break away from the companies. With a team of five people, including GoldenEye's designers Duncan Botwood and David Doak, a man who appears several times within GoldenEye as Dr. Doak and many of the enemy models you encounter, leaving to create their own new company called Free Radical Designs. Free Radical Designs was officially formed and launched by April of 1999, and the team there wasted no time getting to work on a new original IP, which would launch in October of 2000. This IP was called Time Splitters and would go on to become Free Radical Designs' flagship series. Time Splitters was received very well, but it was the sequel game Time Splitters 2, which released just about two years to the date and no longer exclusive to the PS2, that really cemented Free Radical Design as a four to be reckoned with, going down as one of the generation's best reviewed and most fondly remembered games. The Time Splitters franchise would eventually get a third entry called Time Splitters 3 Future Perfect, but that wouldn't be until three years after the release of the second game. In the time between, they released their second original IP called Second Sight, a one-off game released to basically every platform available at the time that followed in the same sort of vein as Time Splitters, wherein action and shooting was core to the gameplay, but there were many layers added on top of that, and a great emphasis was also put on telling an engaging story. This is the game we're talking about today. Though many maybe feel this was Free Radical Design's bastard child, the game they eked out between two of their greatest titles, it was actually the first game they wanted to develop when they formed their company. Only at that time, they felt they lacked the budget, talent, and internal technology to pull it off. And so the game had to be put on the back burner for a few years. After two Time Splitters games, Second Sight would be their first venture into third person gameplay, which came with many new challenges, such as developing new control and camera styles. In the end, opting to allow the player to switch on the fly between first person stationary views, fixed camera angles, and a 3D rotational camera controlled with a second analog stick. Of these three choices, the fixed camera angles were the default. Prior to Second Sight's release, Doak expressed frustrations with the way the video game market was going, with sequel and movie licenses dominating the field, making it harder and harder to get funding for original projects. Free Radical Design spent a lot of time and money making Second Sight and needed it to be a success, thus showing their investors and hopefully future investors that unique ideas still had a place in the market. This was an ironic twist of fate where Doke's greatest contribution to video games at that point, his work on 007's GoldenEye, proved that movie licensed games could in fact be quality, and now it was the level of quality and success of that specific genre he felt threatened by. Despite his fears, however, Second Sight released, sold well, then rode off quietly into the sunset. The world simply moved on and left it behind. Though it was certainly remarkable in some regards, it didn't leave a remarkable impact. So let me take this opportunity to put some memory of it back into the ethos, where it will likely once again completely dissipate and be forgotten about. But you can't say I didn't try.
Second Sight unfolds its story in a non-linear fashion, beginning with our main character, John Vadic, Free Radical's latest model of bald white guy, awaking in a hospital bed to the realization of his psychic powers. Powers that allow him to break the shackles that bind him to the table, and also manipulate the electronic lock that keeps him trapped in the room. Before he awakes in this room, however, we hear bits and pieces of a conversation between the guards that are transporting him, talking about how much of a bad guy he really is, and how he might be better fit for an electric chair than an operating table. But this is all the clues were given into who our player character is before he awakes on the table with amnesia. This whole intro brings to mind a couple fantastic games, namely The Suffering and Sanitarium. According to the game's director, one of the biggest influences on the story was the film Jacob's Ladder. And this definitely shows as we go along, though Second Sight does not leave you wondering or scratching your head when the credits roll. Every question you have should be thoroughly answered by the end. Now as the story continues, John proceeds out of the hospital and begins discovering some of his latent psychic powers. And these discoveries might be some of the best and worst use of plot armor I've ever seen. And it happens a lot. <laughs> Almost any time John is in trouble in a cutscene, he has the same reaction and develops or otherwise remembers a new power that'll save his hide. And this could be cool if it wasn't so funny and also kind of lazy. It really does suck some of the energy out of these early stages, establishing John as possibly one of the most overpowered characters of the generation. But that's in the cutscenes. When it comes to the gameplay balance, well, let me read you the account of the difficulty from one of the writers on TV tropes while I play obviously completely unrelated footage in the background. Second Sight is a third person shooter with stealth gameplay and psychic powers thrown into the mix, with stealth being the preferred method of solving missions, especially in the early chapters. John unlocks his powers slowly, and even though they are progressively strengthened, he is rarely ever a match for more than two well-armed opponents. So, yeah, John Vadic, henceforth known as John Fat Dick, is absurdly powerful. For at least the first half of the game, it's no issue to run up to large, infinitely spawning men with pistols and submachine guns and just fist them to death. Or punch them to death with your fists. Weirdly, punches are much stronger than shooting with the guns early on. In the latter half, enemies dodge your punches more often and they're able to take more hits in general, so shooting is recommended then. So when you get low on health, it's usually pretty easy to hide around the corner and use John's healing ability to march yourself back into the fray, a completely rejuvenated man. The enemies really stand no chance against him. John Fat Dick is just a bald, murdering psychopath whose power knows no bounds. Having said all that, that really only applies if you choose to engage with the enemies. As mentioned, there is an emphasis on stealth, something they definitely modeled after Metal Gear Solid's approach, but it's a little hit or miss. Hiding in a locker or something almost immediately ends enemy aggro, but for most of the game, it's just easier and less time consuming to gun them all down and keep moving. Further, it's incredibly difficult to get caught if you just use John's charm ability, which effectively turns him completely invisible. Granted, you can only use any ability so much as they do drain the blue psi meter up here. But it's not hard to run from one cover to the next using the charm ability, then hiding for a moment for it to automatically recharge, rinse, and repeat. Between healing and charm, you can get yourself through almost the entirety of the game without challenge. But of course, John has a complement of other powers that level up as you go. For example, telekinesis at first only allows you to manipulate inorganic matter, with a later upgrade unlocking the ability to force choke your enemies and throw them around like the ragdolls they are. Psy Blast, another of John's powers, is a pretty lethal attack that allows John to silently hurl balls of psionic energy at his foes. This later upgrades to create a large AoE attack around John, which hurls enemies away from him, knocking them out for a brief period, which gives you a great opportunity to go around and kick them to death before they get up, or shoot them dead while they're completely defenseless. It's as effective as it is hilarious. 
Then we have projection, an ability that sends out a projection of John that enemies can't see. John can't move his real body and his projected body at the same time, but the projection can move about undetected and interact with buttons and stuff, which comes in handy for some light puzzle solving. Projection later upgrades to allow John to possess enemies, making it so you rarely have to risk your own flesh in battle. Of course, when all else fails, you have a full complement of guns at your disposal too. As an early third person shooter on console, it functions here like many others. Nothing in the game gets done without auto-aim. So when you aim, the reticle typically lands on or around an enemy's chest, but you can manipulate it from here and try to go for that prized headshot. The sniper rifles in particular, however, work a little bit different than usual, with the scope not taking over your entire field of vision, rather being relegated to a little viewport in the bottom right of the screen. This is a neat approach I like quite a bit, actually. It keeps the action fully in your view. The auto aim for snipers too is insanely accurate, usually serving as a quick way for me to locate enemies when I have no idea where they are. I did hit a small repeatable glitch, however, involving the sniper's viewport when possessing enemies who are using sniper rifles. If you're looking down your scope while possessing somebody and your possession link gets broken, the scope image stays on your screen until you hit a cutscene or a load screen. I also discovered something a little funky while cycling through powers and weapons in first person mode. As is normal in first person games, your body gets called out of existence. So when standing in front of mirrors, a new body is created within the mirror to replicate what you're doing, but it hardly follows John's visible motions. It's not like this when you're in third person and the body isn't called out, that works fine. Now, similar to how John keeps remembering his powers following his amnesia, he gradually remembers the events that brought him to the hospital at the start of the game. And that's where our non-linear story begins. Every time John remembers his past, we go back and play new missions set six months prior to the events of John awaking in the hospital. Here we discover John was working for the US military on a team called Winter Ice. Unlike most shooters of the era, John, our playable character, wasn't the macho guy who's gonna solve everything with a big gun and a bigger gun. If anything, he was the skeptic nerdy type who was opposed to the whole mission. But he goes along to fulfill his role to the team, all the way to the cold heart of Russia as their personal parapsychology expert alongside another psychic advisor, Jane Wilde. After a brief trip into his past and meeting the team of Winter Ice, John in the modern day gains access to a computer and searching for information on Jane Wilde, discovers that she died on the mission to Russia. Another flashback from here brings us back to the Winter Ice team and the mission that killed Jane. Only on this mission, John manages to intervene in her fate and save her, which is then reflected in the modern day with her file on the computer being updated to show that yes, she is alive now. However, she's now locked up in a mental institution. This is where a puzzle in the history of John's past begins to form. Not so much a puzzle to fill in the blanks, but a puzzle as to whether or not he's able to change his past through these flashbacks in a style similar to the 2004 film, The Butterfly Effect. The general events of the story between the beginning and end aren't much to write home about. Just Winter Ice progressing their mission in Russia and John experiencing the same effect of past and present not lining up before and after his flashbacks. But playing through the game is generally fun despite being really overpowered. Missions are short, varied in location, and interspersed with enough unique events, stealth and shooting sections, and unlocking of new powers to keep things ticking along comfortably. There's maybe one mission that sticks out as being worse than the rest, but given it's an escort mission, this shouldn't really come as any surprise. When you break Jane out of the insane asylum, she's obviously not of sound mind and needs constant encouragement to progress, something you do by targeting her and using your charm ability. This stage isn't big, but if she decides to be uncooperative, which is likely, it can end up being one of the longest stages in the game, which, in a game that's only about six hours long, will really stick out. The enemies, however, do not come in a very wide variety, mostly just guards and soldiers with different levels of armor and weapons. It's only in the late game you encounter a new enemy type known as the Shock Trooper. Shock Troopers, like John, have psionic powers, only they use an ability he surprisingly doesn't have, which is essentially just a force field. Their force fields can be disabled by using your Psy Blast or Telekinesis against them, but otherwise, all they do is stop bullets from hitting them until they take enough damage. But from this point on, there's not much more I can put out there about this game without getting into spoilers. And as I mentioned at the start of the video, there is a pretty big plot twist that, when you're not expecting it, can very well validate a playthrough on its own. It is because of this plot twist I held any memory of the game at all, and in replaying it, it's still a pretty wild twist that I cannot do justice to the game without discussing. So if you intend on playing Second Sight for yourself, click to this time code here. And if you don't intend on playing it or you just don't care about spoilers, then stay tuned.
When Winter Ice left the United States for Siberia, their mission was to rescue a scientist named Grienko, who was seeking political asylum. This scientist, they would discover, was running experiments and studies on a group of children who exhibited supernatural psionic powers. Powers a projection of a child helped awaken in John Vadic, who happened to have basically all of the children's powers combined. As Winter Ice got deeper into their mission, things took a disturbing turn when they discovered among the enemies that fired on them were US Special Forces. These US Special Forces were working on behalf of a man named Silas Hansen, the head of the NSE. Hansen was funding Grienko's research in Siberia with intent on stealing it as it neared completion. But with the cover about to get blown on the whole operation, Hansen's plans had to be wrapped up quickly. So with the results of the experiments in Hansen's hands, he would kill Grienko and the children and use Winter Ice as a scapegoat for when the entire operation would inevitably be uncovered. In the modern day, however, through his flashbacks, John was able to secure the lives of the members of Winter Ice and track down Hansen with intent on exposing him. But when he confronts Hansen, he finds Hansen holds the upper hand, meaning Jane Wilde's life. If John does not comply with Hansen and all of his wishes, then Jane would die then and there. But this is around when John comes to the realization of his final power, and one of the game's coolest plot twists built around a deceptively simple idea. John, this is your final power, precognition. Don't you see the ability to know what is gonna happen? And if you know what is going to happen, then you can stop it. John, you've got to understand, you're not really here. What do you mean? This is not the present. This is a possible future. But I, I've been here already. John, don't lose yourself. Stay focused. Remember where you really are. In the center base, under Debrensk. You must stop Hansen. At this realization, it's revealed that John hasn't been affecting the present by changing the past. Rather, he's been affecting the future by changing the present. You can't change the past. You're so wrong, Hansen. This isn't the past. It's the present. John's power of precognition had been active for the entirety of the journey, and the actual present day didn't begin with him awaking in the hospital with amnesia. It began at his briefing for Winter Ice. Winter Ice is the present. Everything else is a possible future obscured by one simple line of text that entirely changes player and character perspective. Six months ago. This plot twist feels like something one would expect to see in a game like 999 or Virtue's Last Reward. Yet here it is, in a goofy third-person shooter from the early 2000s, lifting the title up well beyond anything it otherwise might have deserved in terms of notoriety. At least, sort of. Cause the game is still kind of forgotten. But for this one thing alone, for those who played it, it's likely remembered very fondly. But anyway, John, now armed with the knowledge of the future, manages to prevent Hansen's future evil deeds by just preventing Hansen's future. And the game kind of just ends after that. There's not much falling action to the game. Following the team's extraction from Russia, the credits just roll on repeat, and that's that. So yeah, looking back, Second Sight doesn't live up to my memory entirely, and it's a pretty flawed game at the core of its mechanics. But the mystery and the plot twist that solves it certainly make for an interesting experience that I think is seldomly matched within the genre today. Following Second Sight, Free Radical would develop the third Time Splitters game before hanging the series up to work on other things. As they moved into the PS3 360 generation, Free Radical put a new IP into development called Haze. Only development on Haze would end up very strained when they decided they would indeed make a licensed game once more, having had the only IP they were interested in, Star Wars, come knocking on their door. 
Free Radical was tasked with developing Star Wars Battlefront 3 simultaneously with Hayes. Development on Star Wars Battlefront 3 was going okay at first, and the team didn't feel too much pressure from their higher ups. However, there came a day that management at LucasArts would change, and the new leader was known to be extremely ruthless, firing many high ranking officials within the company in his first few weeks. From there, development on Battlefront 3 became incredibly difficult. Free Radical were no longer able to function as a team of passionate developers just making the game they wanted for the players they catered to. Instead, everything had to be done to the letter of somebody else's law, and company meetings would all be done in the presence of lawyers. Though time and budget was tight, Hayes eventually released to average and below reception, and the sales unfortunately followed the same trend. PC. Unfortunately, Hayes is one of those games that was pretty creative on, on concept, but very, very weak in execution. Poor gameplay, weak visuals, and an unsatisfying storyline in multiple directions all led up to a title that probably should have been put back on the shelf a long time before it was decided to be released. This reception put LucasArts on edge, who ultimately ended up pulling the plug on Star Wars Battlefront 3, while it was at 96 to 99% completion, also ending the contract they drew up for the development of Star Wars Battlefront 4. This put Free Radical Design on incredibly unstable ground. Their last game flopped, and their current game was now unable to release. They shopped ideas around to investors from here, but due to the reception of Hayes, investors were not willing Willing to bank on them anymore. Unable to bear the struggle for too long, Free Radical's greatest fears came true. Licensed games indeed erased them from the market. But it wasn't the competition licensed games posed like they originally thought. It was instead the opportunities that they provided that met to ill ends. Unable to secure work, Free Radical Design was bought out by Crytek in 2009, where they developed games and ports for them for the next five years. These games being Crisis 2 and 3, a port of Crisis 1, and Warface a free-to-play first-person shooter. After this, the team and their legacy would appear dormant. That is, until 2021, when they resurfaced again as Free Radical Design, also announcing the revival of the Time Splitters IP. Though we may never see a revival for Second Sight, and honestly, it doesn't need additional entries or anything, it is a happy ending to me that a team originally built out of passion, a team who wanted nothing but to push the art of video games and the limitations of genre works, will once again see the light of day, free to design whatever radical ideas they have, limited only by their imaginations, and maybe a bit of budget. And that's about all I have to say on Free Radical Design and Second Sight. If you guys enjoyed the video, you know the deal, and thank you all for sticking through to the end. But while we're here, just in case you noticed a little bit of a uh, jank in this video, I have recently moved into a new office, and uh, the sound in here, as you probably noticed just with this recording, is not well. I actually had to do the uh, back half of this video three times because uh, I just could not get good sound uh, recording it. In fact, here's a little example of what it sounded like the first time. In a style similar to the 2004 film, The Butterfly Effect. The general events of the story between the beginning and end aren't much to write home about. Now, I, at one point I was gonna cut my losses and just leave that because like, I mean, not many people are gonna watch this video anyway, but like, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So yeah, I had to transport my setup back downstairs to the basement where I recorded before and uh, re-record the audio there. But even with doing that, there was still a little bit of a difference in the recording quality between the first half and the second half of the video. So hopefully it didn't stand out too much or uh, ruin the video for any of you guys. But I'm here now. This is the office. I will be uh, treating these bare walls a little bit more, so hopefully I won't have to do this again. Hopefully I can do my uh, audio recording in here in the future, but right now I'm kind of working between two separate office spaces. Not the easiest thing to do, but uh, for the past few years I have been editing from a couch, which is really just murder on the back and the neck and like, God, I do not recommend anybody do it. So hopefully this is the start of a bright new future for editing for this channel. Anyway, thank all of you for watching. Leia, what are you doing? I'll let you out in a second. Anyway, see ya.